So uh, now we're going to switch, switch gears in terms of who we're hearing from. So the next speaker is a former student um, who was part of Vector from 2005 to 2009. Uh, what started as, as just coming to Friday staff meetings for the pizza ended in him becoming managing editor for his uh, final year. Um, immediately after graduating, he and some other NJT buddies worked on a startup to pave a path to becoming a billionaire. Uh, but currently, he is the uh, a publisher of uh, Red and Green and the CEO of Broad Street, which delivers ad campaigns for publishers. So, please give Kenny Patsgrow a warm welcome. All right, thank you, Yuki, and uh, thank you to everyone who put this together. This is awesome. I was actually asking um, if the Vector had actually ever done this before, and uh, I guess it was like 25 years ago or something. Does anybody remember that? Okay, well, it's nice that we do this every quarter century. So, um, yeah, now I'm looking forward to the next one. Actually, before I start, I have a really important question. It's a very serious question. Um, does anybody remember, just show of hands, uh, how WJTB lost their FCC license? Okay, all right, because I got a follow up question that's actually more important. So, how did they lose it, Steve? <laughs> We've got the rumor. We know the rumor, but. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody else? Who, who's got. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the story I heard was that they tapped into the rail lines and broadcast all the yeah. way down yeah. Florida. Yeah, that's what I heard too. I've always thought it was. Right. Now, uh, here's the follow up, and this is what we don't know. How did they do that? See, we're all journalists, right? We all got that. We got to get to the bottom of this. <laughs> this is important stuff. I want to know. Um, anyway, as Miriam uh, mentioned, uh, I'm the publisher of Red Bank Green. It's a hyperlocal news outlet. Um, and the 100-year thing, I mean, was particularly resonant because um, I bought, in fact, I tried to, I resisted uh, taking over Red Bank Green. I didn't want to do it because, as you guys know, uh, journalism, um, it's kind of in a state of change right now, to put it, to understate it, um, because uh, there isn't nearly as much advertising money as there used to be, and so uh, your local papers have more or less evaporated, and now we're trying to figure out what works. So I went over uh, Red Bank Green, and I said, you know, I have to do something, because the journalism industry, they kind of just keep talking about how everything is like going downhill and how awful it is, and I actually don't like that story. So I said, well, you know, maybe I'll take over Red Bank Green and we'll try to make it a model for uh, the future, something that is going to work. So um, I told everybody that Red Bank Green is going to live to 100 years. That's what I said, it's going to be 100 years old. And uh, it was started in 2006 by a guy named John Ward. And, um, uh, you know, I picked it up at year uh, 17 or 18, and we're going to get to 100 years. But I printed up these uh, sweatshirts. Long live local news, Red Bank Green for 100 years. And I brought one for the person who helps me figure out uh, how they got that rail line hooked up for WJTB. So, uh, I actually just flew in from Chicago this morning. Um, I just came from a publishing conference. And um, most publishing conferences are actually pretty sad right now. Um, it's a very somber tone. And they usually talk about what's not working, but the one I came from was actually extremely optimistic. It was called the Niche Media Conference. And um, one of the people that I met, it just happened this way, uh, this 82-year-old guy, and uh, he was the publisher, and I'm gonna get off the stage, I'm gonna go get this thing. And I know this microphone's been a little wonky, so I can't wait to see what happens. Does it still work? All right, he is the publisher of, I met him and his wife, Mike and Robin. They're the publisher of uh, Up Magazine, and they're uh, kind of in the UP, as they call it, which is that part of Michigan, it's the peninsula that shoots out. I didn't know anybody had ever, ever actually been there. Turns out there's a newspaper. Um, and Up Magazine uh, has been going for about 36 years, and Mike's a very optimistic dude, and his wife is too, and he invited me to his 100th birthday party. And I said, Mike, why do you, like you, he says, I'm inviting everyone. I said, why do you do it? I was curious. And he said, I'm an optimist. And he said, I'm gonna live to 100, I'm inviting people, I'm already planning it. And I said, I absolutely 
love that, and it was too fitting, so I had to work them in to the talk tonight. So, um, 2005, how did I get into this publishing thing? Um, 2005, I'd actually, uh, you know, I was a commuter. So I commuted to school, and I tried to avoid any kind of extracurricular. I didn't want to get involved at all. And um, I, in fact, NJIT, by the way, um, NJIT had a tough time getting in. I'd applied for the computer science program. I had to practically beg to get in. Um, they let me into uh, the IT program and I eventually got in. So um, once I got here, I just kind of wanted to get in and, uh, and get out. But uh, I remember I was walking down the campus center, which had just been built, and I saw the vector and I figured I'd see what was going on. And I couldn't believe some of the things that I had been reading in the vector. Um, I had read some columns written by Kevin Urban over there. And I was like, what is going on at this paper? And um, it seemed like that everybody was having a lot of fun, which is really important. Um, but I joined the vector thinking that somehow I was going to have a, make an improvement. And so, like you said, said, uh, you know, for the first probably few months, I just showed up and ate the pizza and listened to Shy uh, run the meetings. Um, then eventually, I decided I was going to report on the first story. Some real hard-hitting stuff, by the way, because the Taco Bell Express and the Campus Center had just opened up and it was an operational nightmare. Someone had to get to the bottom of this. So after waiting in a long line, uh, waiting for whatever thing, like one taco, I guess it was like three bucks or whatever, I gave the cashier $10, I got the change back, and I noticed that the cash register said, change 666. I was like, oh no. <laughs> so I write, uh, I write a story about all this, this operational disaster that Taco Bell was, and I title it, Taco Hell, and I have the picture. <laughs> and I think, I think it was pretty good. Well, I come into the campus center, I think it was the next Tuesday, which is the day that the things ended up on the rack, and it was front page news. I had made the front page and I didn't know if I was mortified or if I thought it was the funniest thing on the planet. And um, I think that fun is actually one of the things that, uh, that we all had at, um, at the Vector. It's such an important part of what we do. Mike, uh, who runs UP Magazine, he said like those five W's are really important. Who, what, when, where, why. What about wit? Like, what about humor? What about the fun in what we do? So, um, I don't think that anybody here was paid to be on the Vector staff, right? Editor in chief got tuition, half tuition. Yeah, we know, I know we got that, yeah. right? And, and at some point, the e board got a little something. But for the most part, we weren't doing it. And it's not like we jumped right into that position. For the most part, we weren't doing it for the money, right? We were doing it because it was a lot of fun. That's why we do. We got to play reporter. And sometimes we did it well. In fact, I saw in the Vector office, I saw an award from SPJ, Society of Professional Journalists, last year. Never could I have imagined under my tenure that we would do something like that. So with magnitude and direction, we're moving in the right direction. So um, anyway, so after NJIT, uh, I actually went into software. So uh, I was a software developer, computer science major, and ended up working at a company, you may remember it because nobody knows it anymore, it was called Yahoo. And um, so I ended up working on their advertising, their tech stack, uh, which was weird, but it was Yahoo, so like, you know, I liked, they had a foosball table and that was cool enough, so I'll work on practically anything. So um, that's how I fell into advertising, and I moved to Red Bank, New Jersey. Has anybody been to Red Bank, by the way? All right, cool. So I moved to Red Bank, New Jersey, and my wife was scrolling on her phone, and she said, uh, hey, Red Bank Green, which is a local news operation, uh, Red Bank Green is looking for a webmaster. I was like, I'm sure I can help with that. So uh, I met the editor, and this is around 2011. I met the editor, and uh, I ended up working with Red Bank Green. Well, what actually happened is that uh, Red Bank Green was a one-person show. And they were actually covering a lot of things in town that nobody else was covering. Um, Red Bank Green was the one, and John Ward, the editor, was the one going to the meetings, the, the town hall meetings, the municipal meetings. He was the one covering when like, businesses were opening and businesses were closing. He was having fun. He was also kind of digging deep on the important stuff, too. Um, but he had a problem. This is what kind of like, um, you know, a, a little idea of what was to come. He had an advertiser that was going to cancel. His oldest advertiser had been with Red Bank Green for the longest time. 
And um, he reached out to me, he said, Kenny, uh, this advertiser is gonna cancel. The reason he's gonna cancel is because he puts his lunch specials on Facebook. He doesn't need to run ads with me anymore because now he's got Facebook and he's got Google, he's got everything. Right? Why would he work with a newspaper? So what I did was I built this app, being a software developer, I built this thing that would pull in his lunch special from Facebook and put it into an ad on Red Bank Green. And the advertiser did not cancel. In fact, he stayed on for not just another six months, not just another year. He is a paying advertiser to this day at Red Bank Green. I said, wow, that was really, that was really impressive. I asked Stu, who was the, uh, the advertiser, I said, um, you know, why did you buy that? And uh, why, you know, what, what do you like about it so much? And uh, he's like, you know, it works. It works, people come in, they mention the ad all the time. In fact, if you go to what eventually became uh, the website of the company that was built around this, uh, you can, broadstreetads.com, you can see Stu talk about it right there. Um, we have the video right on the front page of the, the website. But this idea of like selling advertising, which it sounds really boring. Advertising sounds really, how could you get behind that? But it's selling advertising that was actually working for a small business. Selling something that you thought was really gonna do a good job for someone. Doing a good job for someone. Part of the reason that uh, the newspaper industry has had such a difficult time is that the advertising hasn't really been doing a good job for someone. So it was this idea of like, how can we, how can we make this available to all of these publishers so, so all of our publishers can do a great job for these small businesses? Well, anyway, started a company um, with another NJIT person, a guy named John Carpezzi, and we built it up uh, to about 500 customers, right? And um, you know, it's still a very small company, got about 15 employees. And the publisher of Red Bank Green came back to me and said, um, you know, he said, hey, listen, I'm looking to retire. Do you want to take over uh, Red Bank Green? I said, absolutely not. I'm not getting into this. I've seen everything that's going on in the newspaper industry. But then I started to worry. I started to think, well, if I don't take it over, then who's gonna do it? If I'm not covering the news, then who's gonna do it? It's not gonna be tap into. I'm sure some of you have tap into in your town. Um, it's not gonna be patch. They don't really do a good job. The only one that's actually doing a good job around here is Red Bank Green. So uh, I almost felt like that I had a duty to take it over um, because somebody has to keep the, the candle lit. Somebody has to be the one to shine the light into the dark places. Um, as much fun as we had had at Red Bank Green, um, there is really, really important stuff that we do. And we get a little taste of that at the vector. So the first four years of Broad Street, by the way, um, we didn't really, like, really make any money. I know it just sounded like everything was fantastic after that. I really worked to try and make that uh, happen. Um, and that kind of speaks to the longevity piece. Why in the world would somebody do something for no money, right? Which would probably boggle my mind coming out of college. They'll say like, you know, and by the way, uh, just for those of you who are still in school, how many, or how many people want to be rich, right? Or wanted to be rich when they came out of college? 100%, I'd say almost, or I, I think a lot of us did. And um, when I first started Broad Street, I actually did it probably for the wrong reasons. I say there might be a real opportunity here. Um, but the thing that actually keeps you with anything for a really long time, it's, uh, it's not actually money, right? And I found that out. Like, I came around to this. Um, and I found out like that money is like is important at a baseline. But um, really, it's like the only reason money is valuable is because like other people think it's, that, that's like really our sense of the value of it. Our idea of the value of money is actually very dependent on other people's idea of the value of money. The things that actually keep you invested in stuff long term are the things that are intrinsically important to you. And I realized that like, if you wanna stick with anything for a long time, if I really wanna have Red Bank Green last for 100 years, then there's really only a few things that are important um, that it's important work that I'm learning, that I'm having fun doing it, and I get to work with people that I really like. And I think that probably applied for all of us at The Vector. We were having fun, we were doing important work, we got to work with people that we liked. 
Is that right? I think it's probably right. So, um, one of the, my favorite questions at Broad Street uh, to ask uh, potential uh, candidates or job candidates, I ask them, say you're 100 years old. When you look back, what mattered to you? I like to get a sense of the things that are important to them. And uh, you know what? It's actually, it's always the same answer. In fact, uh, in uh, Up Magazine, I don't know if anyone's ever seen the movie Catch Me If You Can. Leonardo DiCaprio is a good one, right? There was an interview with Frank Abagnale that they did. He usually doesn't grant an interview. And he actually regretted writing the book. He made a bunch of money with the book. He actually regretted writing the book. He said, um, you know, I, I kept working at, you know, once I got out of jail, I ended up uh, working at grocery stores, and I wrote the book, and I embellished some things, and he regretted doing all of that. He said, I wish I could just go back and have been, like, a grocery manager. He would have been much happier doing that, because, like, he felt that, like, his entire story, his entire life became something that wasn't true. He didn't like uh, living with that anymore. And uh, the interviewer asked him, you know, what do you think... What is a good life, and uh, what would you tell that to a young Frank Jr.? And he said, I think a good life is to find someone that you love, that loves you, someone who's a good mother to have children. I think children are the most incredible thing. By the way, this is his own view. Happens to a human, raising their children, being a great father, and bringing uh, your children up, um, being good fathers and husbands. I would have been very happy at the grocery store. I think about it every day. I've noticed that when I ask that question about 100 years, it's always the same things. It's about friends and family and all of that stuff. Um, the most important things that kind of keep us going are the things that we like kind of knew all along. So um, anyway, one of the things that we can't actually ever forget is that no matter, no matter how serious it is, no matter how like dire the circumstances for the, or the newspaper industry are, uh, we can't ever forget to have fun in what we do. Um, at the Vector, we've all been a part of something wonderful, right? Um, we're all part of this great story that lasted for 100 years. And like Miriam said, uh, I would love to see it last another century. I'm sure the people who started this thing 100 years ago didn't maybe thought 100 years into the future, but they were just having fun too and getting this thing kicked off. Um, so here we are today at a 100 year mark looking into uh, 100 years into the future. So I just want to conclude. I don't know how long it's been. Uh, I just want to conclude with, um, you know, to first of all, my friend Mike at UP Magazine, that he lives to 100, uh, that Red Bank Green lives to 100, and that the NJIT vector with magnitude and direction mm -hmm. lasts another 100 years. So to the NJIT vector for another 100 years, long live local news, by the way. Thank you.